Uh, so we're going to give a whole video about lying, marking, and uh, how exactly you go about getting accurate and clean lines, because your joinery is only as good as your marking you do. The better you make your marking, the better your joinery will be. And if you can improve your joinery game, or if you can improve your marking game, your joinery game will be that much better. So um, tonight we're going to be looking through a whole bunch of different methods, different things to think about, and uh, ways to get around it. So uh, hope you have a lot of fun. Um, on that note, um, I do want to say a, a huge thank you to everyone joining the live chat. If you are um, watching this live, then have fun in the chat. My wife is down there. Um, and, uh, she's with us today. Sarah's ready. Uh, she's <laughs> monitoring the chat and throwing up any questions that happen on there. So if you do have any questions in there, put them in there. Um, if you are watching this recorded, so it's not live, then uh, there will be a list of all of the questions asked down in the description. If timestamps decide that it takes you roughly where in the video, so you can hop over there and see that. Um, also, as a heads up, uh, we were having some technical difficulties earlier. Um, so if suddenly the screen has disappeared and then video plays with flashing colored lines, um, I need to stop and reboot my capture card because it appears it is dying on me. <laughs> so hopefully I'll have that fixed. Um, and hopefully it stays the way it actually is live, so we'll see. Uh, lots of fun things happen in the chat. Um, whoa, whoa. What? I don't know. I was scrolling and it just totally jumped to... Oh, did, did you like that? Whoa. Just X? Yep. I was like, that is not wood by right chat all of a sudden on my screen. <laughs> Technology is always, always fun. So um, today we're going to be looking at lines. And I want to start by looking at um, the thicknesses of lines because that is one of the places that people immediately have uh, issues is that you can completely change your joinery by the tool you use for marking. Now, when I'm doing... Whoa, 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 whoa. Your mic's off. My mic is off? My mic is off. All this time I've been talking and my mic is off. I just caught up on the chat. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't want to hear you anyways. It's the Sarah yes. Wright Show. Welcome to Wood by Wright Live, where everything goes a little crazy. Ah, oh, yes. A little crazy. A lot. <laughs> One of these days, I want to actually do a video and show you all of the cables and camera and electrical systems that are here to make a live happen. Um, it is actually rather impressive. And if any one thing goes out, the whole thing dies. So is that where you're careful not to cross your lines? Yeah, I need to cross my lines and dot my eyes and here, I'll cross this line. Oh, Sarah, Sarah's ready tonight for yeah, the line. Yeah, I crossed that line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so you can seriously change your woodworking and joinery merely by the tool you use to lay down your marks. Uh, when I'm doing rough layout, in other words, I have a rough sawn board and I want to draw some marks on there, I grab my layout square which is a very large square. And with this, I'm gonna be using a lead holder. This is a very, very fat lead. It's a pencil and it goes through um, rough lumber and rides across all the lines and I don't break it easily. I'll show you this a little bit closer. Um, in the past, I've used Sharpies, but those tend to wear out very, very quickly. Um, but I've really liked using the, uh, the lead holders. Focus and switch over. Um, and this is a lead holder. It's, it looks like a pencil, but the, the lead on it is incredibly huge. Um, let me zoom, see if I can get this a little closer. Whoa. Whoa. There we go. See how fat that lead is. And that will actually uh, withstand a lot of abuse. It's, it's thick enough and hard enough that I can use it on rough cut lumber. Um, so I've been using this one for a long time. And as a sneak peek at Saturday's video, I actually made this one in Saturday's video, so uh, stay tuned for that. But a lead holder um, is what I absolutely love for, for doing rough cut joinery. The problem with it is it has a really big lead, so it leaves a really big line. Now, for rough cutting, that's not a problem because usually I'm still gonna stay like a quarter inch, a half inch away from the line because I'm always making them much bigger than they need to be for the rough cutting. But then we can start looking at the thickness, whoop, let me get this down on here, the thickness of other lines. And here I've got four different marks. So we got our Sharpie mark, and that is a really nice big bold line. You can see that. Um, but you might end up wearing through your felt tip and, and uh, 
burning these pretty quickly on rough lumber. And so that's why I use a lead holder. And I get this line, you can still see it. It's a thinner, more accurate line than the Sharpie line, but it's still a fairly fat line. So I'm wondering, you know, if I need to cut on this line, do I cut on this side of the line? Or do I cut on this side of the line? Or do I try to cut down the middle? Um, th there's a thickness to this line, so it's not a very accurate line. And so all of your cuts, right now this line is eh, just a little over a 32nd of an inch wide. And so none of my cuts will be any more accurate than a 32nd of an inch wide. Now, yes, I could always say, I always cut on this side of the line, or I always cut on this side of the line, but then you, there's still a little bit of inaccuracy in that. So next we move over to this one, and this is a finer line, which is a little harder to see, uh, but this is actually made, uh, this one was made with a pin, uh, but sometimes I'll use a really nice fine mechanical pencil and I'll get a nice clean line. But still with that, there's a thickness to the line. Now this may only be a 64th of an inch, and then a lot of times that's okay, but if I'm making joinery and I'm making a final line that I want to cut on, I'm going to use this line over here. And this is a marking gauge line. Um, and the only problem with it is they, they can sometimes be very hard to see, um, as you can see here in the video. And if I get, you know, I can see this fine because I'm here in person. And I know some people will come in with a mechanical pencil and then fill in that line. But the nice thing about this is it's an infinitely small line. I'm not worrying about do I cut on this side or this side. This knife cut is actually the first cut of the saw. So I bring this in here and I slide this across. I'm literally making a cut. I'm slicing the fibers. And <laughs> that was a bad line, so whatever. And so I know that everything on this side of the line stays and everything on this side of the line goes. Uh, it is a infinitely small line that makes everything more accurate. So if you're making a cut, and this is going to be the final mark that determines the length of the board, use a marking knife to make that cut. Now I know this is a point that I've used. Go ahead. I was writing for my joke, you weren't supposed to okay. stop. This is an accurate, this is a point that I use all the time. A marking knife is way, way better than any pencil or pin when it comes to final joinery this will be one of the greatest improvements in your woodworking if you're making all of your joinery cuts uh, all your joinery cuts with a pen or pencil this will improve everything and there's an hour show in five minutes ready do you know what this is word line what my pickup lines oh <laughs> there's a reason i married her it wasn't for her pickup lines <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions before I move on? Oh yes, I owe a mom joke because well, yeah, that that is I we can count that because I think was it Tom who super chatted before we oh, started. Oh yeah, he had one at the beginning. Thanks, Tom. So I don't know, Tom. Does that count? I got more. <laughs> I got lots more. She's been practicing for this one. And now all sound is gone. What? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Might just be one person. I don't know. Um, so um, that, that's the first thing I want to cover is it, there's a lot that is very dependent upon what you use to make your marks. And there are reasons to use all of them. There's reasons why I have them all here. But most of the time, if I'm doing rough marks, I'm using a lead holder just because it's quick and easy. And if I'm doing fine marks, I'm going to be using a marking knife because this is the, the, the final cut. Everything on one side of this oh. cut mark goes and everything on the other cut side stays. But this can be hard to see. And so some people will fill it in with pencil and you'll see um, a lot of YouTubers will do that is if they make a marking knife mark, they'll come in with a mechanical pencil and they'll fill it in so that the camera can see it. Uh, but one of the things that I actually like to do, sometimes when I'm making joinery and I'm laying things out, is I'm going to use some tape. And the nice thing about this is it really demonstrates that uh, the idea of everything on one side of the cut goes and everything on the other side of the cut stays. Because with this, I can come over here and I can lay out my lines and I can say, we're gonna do a cut from here to here and then we're gonna slide over to here and we're gonna make a mortise on here and I want to cut you know, here and here. And so I still have these cut lines I can see but now I can come in here and I can actually remove 
that piece of tape from the middle and it becomes very, very obvious I'm, if I'm cutting a mortise or dovetails, everything inside the square goes, everything outside the square stays. And so being able to put tape on and cut through the tape and actually lay out something, then it becomes very, very obvious where all of your cuts are. Um, so using some masking tape is a great trick for actually laying out things, um, particularly for mortises, um, dovetails, any of your joinery where you have multiple angles and multiple sides coming together, it can be very accurate to do it this way because if you're, if you're marking with the grain, sometimes that mark disappears in the grain and you can't quite see it. Going across the grain is a little, little bit easier to see, um, but when you're doing all the different directions together, being able to put some tape on there and actually cut out what you want and visualize what it's going to look like really helps out. Um, so give that one a try. You look like you're about to say something. Oh, I can always say something. <laughs> Any questions so far? No. Okay, now we're going to bring you to a little marking tip that I was shown a long time ago. And it's one of these things that should seem very obvious, um, but I, it's one that every time I bring it up, people are like, wow, that's something wildly obvious. I should have seen that before. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this board and we're going to imagine we're going to cut it. <laughs> hi -ya. Um, but I want to actually cut this square all the way around so that the end of the board is square on all sides. And so we're going to make our mark on here. Let me get this out of the way. And I want to be able to mark all the way around this board. The problem with that is making the mark go all the way around and meet all the sides. So let's say we want to cut the board here. Put my square on here, slide it up against here, and I'm going to make my mark. Now before I go any farther, I need to make sure that this is my reference edge. And so usually what we're going to have is a mark on the board somewhere that looks like this. It's a little curly cue here. And so you have an arrow pointing at the edge, and then you have a curly cue on the edge. So the curly cue indicates that this is the reference edge, and the arrow indicates that this is the reference face. And this corner is the corner that we judge That's everything else off of. What's that? That's an arrow. Yeah, a little arrow right here. Arrow points at the corner right there. Yeah. That looks like a V, but I mean, there should be another line for an arrow. That's an Are arrow. Are you happy? You're breaking tradition. <laughs> so really? I want to make sure. Really? Did you call this an arrow? Yeah, because you're pointing at it. But it means a line. Uh, you're weird. It's, a it's okay. I still love you. I'm weird. It's a so, pot calling a pot a pot. I at least I don't try to plane my own head. I did. Did I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> if you don't know what we're talking about, you should see Instagram. We've been having fun <laughs> there. So. Um, I have the reference edge on here, and I want to make sure that my fence references the reference edge. So I'm going to put that on there, and it's off of that, so I know that this line is 90 degrees to this side. Now when I put it in here, I'm going to put my knife where I want, slide this up against, and I'm going to come across here and I'm going to make a light cut. I'm not going to push much with the, with the knife. And then I'm going to come down and I'm going to push a little bit, not too much, and then I'm really going to come in here and crank down on it. And the reason I'm going to do that is if on my first cut, I really crank down on this, I'm putting a lot of pressure into it, and it's very easy to make the, the square slide one way or the other because you're putting pressure down into it. But if I make a light cut, I'm creating a little groove that then the tip can come in, make it a little heavier, and then I make a really heavy cut that everyone can see. And that way I'm making sure that my first cut isn't going to be pushing the square around, so light, medium, hard. So we made our first cut on this side, now I want to transfer this line all the way around. So I'm going to pick up this board and I'm going to put my square on here. The problem is now my fence is referencing this side of the board when this side is my reference face. So I want to make sure I turn the square over. I'm going to put my knife into that mark and then I'm going to slide the square up against the, kni up against the, the knife. Hold this tight in place so that it's not moving around. And again, I'm going to go light, just make a light course, medium weight, and then really crank it down. Then we'll roll it over one more time, and now I have my reference edge here. I want my fence to reference that edge. I put my knife into the mark, slide the square up against the knife, lock it in place. Then we're going to do medium or light, <laughs> medium, 
Really crank it down. Give me an edge I can see. Okay. Now we're going to lift it up. What's that? Oh, go ahead. And lift it up one more time. And now I don't want this fence on this side because this isn't my reference face. This is my reference face. So we're going to flip this over one more time and put my knife into that line. Slide this up against light, medium, hard. And I haven't even looked at it yet, but I know that this line lines up with the other one perfectly. Dead on exact all the way around. So now I have a line coming all the way around this board that I know is 90 degrees to this reference face and 90 degrees to this reference edge. So this is exactly what I want to cut on. Making this knife mark all the way around gives me the first cut of the saw. It's also going to protect all these fibers so when I cut it I'm not going to get a splintery end. I'm going to get a really nice clean edge all the way around because I used a marking knife to make the mark. It's one of those, those fun things that once you once you get the idea of always keeping the fence on the reference edge and reference face, it suddenly makes so much more sense and makes all of your cuts incredibly accurate. And even if you get a board from the store and it's milled S4S and, and it's clean on all four sides, I usually tell people is before you do any work on it, mark one side your reference face and one side your reference edge. That way you know that you're always putting the square on the same side. Because even if it comes from the store and it's S4S and a beautiful board, there are going to be some variances on the board. There's going to be some slight differences in thickness. Wood moves, it expands and contracts over time. So knowing which side to put the square on is incredibly important, even if you think your board is perfect. It's not, it's wood, it moves. So always know which is your reference side and which is your reference face. Any questions so far? You know, you make it really hard to tell jokes or make a point when you don't breathe. I'm sorry. No, you're not. I'll stop breathing. Okay. <laughs> I've, been, I've been practicing my breathing a lot recently. <laughs> no, what I was going to say is you make it look so easy to, to make that mark. That's hard when I've been doing my bench. Let me tell you. Well, come on over here. Let's just Does it come it. naturally? Let's give this a try. So I'm going to make... Oh, did you warn everybody I don't, I'm not having a stroke and I sound funny because my jaw oh, yeah. won't open? My wife has a weird <laughs> jaw thing. She can't open her mouth. So she talks like this and it looks kind of funny. And we can all make jokes at her because she's away from the chat right now. So, I read faster than you do. Yes, you do. There's... He's breathing yell at him. <laughs> there's your... Let me move the square over. So let me set this up so you guys can see. And I can talk her through. Soon this is, I will have this is one of the, uh, the things we're going to be doing soon. Is she's actually working right now on building her own workbench. Um, so we're going to be doing a full video series of a beginner woodworker building their first woodworking bench. Um, so this is kind of fun to, uh, to, to see. Because there's a lot he of just things. just likes telling me what to do. I've been, you know, this is <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things, you know, I've been doing for years that I, it just comes natural to me and having someone else there who hasn't been doing it for years, it, it's good to then remember what things are. So here, let's, let's lay this out. So I put the square on the mark, or and the knife, or put the knife into the mark first. You never even told me to do that. There. Okay, there. Then clamp it down so that your, your fence is against the board. Now what you want to do is put, want you put your thumb there and see if you can get your fingers over the other side. There you go. Yeah. I have a six inch because you want maximum to, reach. You want to clamp this together if at all possible. There, and slide it up against the knife. Now light cut all the way across. Oh, but you want me to start here? No, you can do it anywhere now. That just gives you the, your points oh, so now gotcha. it's at the mark. So the light cut isn't pushing much. It's just making a slight check and then a little bit harder. Yeah, but this is easier than when I am on the sawhorse trying yeah. to push like this. This is, a, this is an actual representation of how Sarah is. On the She'd be short. Sure. But I want to tell you something. What? This is where I draw the line. <laughs> Wait, if that's your line <laughs> and that's my line, <laughs> whose line is it anyway? <laughs> we were practicing that one. Yeah. See, I helped you with that one. Okay, hang on. Yeah. I gotta get by. Is she gonna dance over the cables? 
Ugh. Where's the Mission Impossible theme song? <laughs> so that's why if you get the tape measure out and you put a knife mark where it's supposed to be at the tape measure, you just put one little mark, then you can put your knife into that mark, slide the square up until it hits that square, hits the knife, and then you know that's your line you need to draw. Rather than trying to put the square onto the mark and then draw the line, put the knife into the mark, put the square onto the knife, and then draw your line. Uh -oh. That way you can get an exact line on your mark. Oh, we got someone sneaking in. <laughs> um, so other things. One of the, the big debates is you have all of your, your materials out and you've got you know, your, your stretchers and your legs and your, um, all of your boards out. How exactly do you go about labeling your boards? Um, and everyone has a different methodology to it. And I like to actually integrate into the boards um, my reference edge and reference face. And usually, I want my reference face to be the front of the cabinet or the front of whatever I'm working on. And then I want my reference edge to be the outside of whatever I'm working on. Or if I don't have an outside and it's a board in the middle, then it's on the right side if looking at it from the front. And so that's just a nomenclature I have to, to keep things in mind. And so to do that, you know, a lot of people when they're marking the board, they'll have uh, like this is the uh, um, leg number one um, on the, the left side. Um, and so marking straight on the board like this, and then you might have like an arrow pointing up on the, the piece. Um, and so you have all of your numbers on there. I used to do a lot of that, but I actually I don't like marking the board with a pencil anymore um, because then you run into the problem of cleaning it off. Now, yes, I'm normally going to be scraping and things like that off, but I often find that my work, I'm going to be scraping this several times. And so if I scrape it off, I have to then come back and mark it on. So most of the time, I'm going to put on, um, I'm going to put on tape on all of my boards for several different reasons. Um, this, I can mark on the tape. And if I do need to surface this board for something, <clears throat> I can peel it off set it to the side, do the board, and put it back on. And I have the exact same mark on the same board in the same place. And that way I, I'm, I can work through it without ever having to remove the material and then try and mark it back on. Number two, it's much easier to see this when it's in a stack. And it's easier to notice that I put this on the front of all of my boards. So this tape is always on my reference face makes it very easy to quickly identify which side this fence needs to be on. And then depending upon the board, I usually have an arrow on my tape pointing towards my reference edge so that it makes it a little more easier to know which side to put the fence on. Um, and just making sure that through all of my, my work pieces, I have a standard for this tape is always towards the front of the cabinet and if it is on the outside, then the outside edge is my reference edge. Um, so being able to do that just makes it a little bit easier for me. But one of the nice things about this, uh, this sport is that there is no right way to do it. This is just the right way to do it. <laughs> and then there's the better website. right way to do it. What's that? I didn't hear what you said. Uh, that's my point. I have... Um, yes, you do have a point. Your hair covers it well, though. <laughs> So your head comes to a point. I have a divot. <laughs> I have three questions when you get Hey, okay, what do we got? Okay, let's see. 24. Okay, good. This is where the stuck jaw makes it difficult. Logan Logging On asks, what are the pros of a knife and what makes it better than a pencil? Um, I talked about that at the beginning, but the, the knife is the first cut of the saw. The knife is an exact line. There is no thickness to the line that the knife makes. Everything on one side of the cut stays, everything on the other side of the cut goes. So it is an infinitely accurate mark. Whereas a pencil, there's a thickness to the mark. Do you cut on one side? Do you cut on the other side? Do you try and go down the middle? Your joinery will only be as accurate as the thickness of your marking tool. And so if you're using a pencil or a pen to mark, the thickness of that line will be the variance in your joinery size. The thickness of that line will be the gaps that you find in your joinery. A knife, if it's done well, it oh, has no gaps. Oh. You can silence my phone. Good gravy. 
Yeah, oh. drag it down and silence it. Otherwise, he's going to call back. It was. I don't think it was him. Um, yeah, so um, that is why for joinery, I use a marking knife rather than a pin. Now, for rough work, when I'm working with rough sawn lumber, I'm going to be using a lead holder and making marks with a pencil. Why? It's faster, it's easier to see, and I don't really care about the thickness of the line because I'm usually going to be cutting away from the line anyways. I'm going to make it uh, much bigger than it needs to be because it's rough cut. It's just getting things roughly to size. Um, yeah. So what other question you had? Tom West wants to know, can you use the spurs on a plane to mark a line, such as using a rabbit plane with the iron pulled up? Uh, sure, I guess. I mean, because that's, that's really what um, spurs are. Is if you're using a rabbit plane, you're, you're cutting a groove across the, gr uh, across the grain. That's actually a dado. If you're, Grooves are grooves that go with the grain. Dados are grooves that go across the grain. Um, so don't call a dado a groove or a groove a dado, otherwise people look at you funny, even though they're both actually grooves. <sighs> Tom I says he doesn't adjust. have a knife. What's that? Tom says he doesn't have a knife. In your kitchen? I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, there are hundreds of types of marking knives out there, and finding one that works well for you is um, kind of one of those interesting things because you can mark with any knife out there and each one has its pros and cons. I have an entire video where I go into types of marking knives and what I like and what I don't like. Um, but yeah. Um, I was just about to ask, you just asked another question I was about to answer. I got sidetracked. Are you ready for another question? No, what was the question you just answered? You asked, I didn't answer that. The one you just asked, I didn't answer. The one about the rabbit plane? Yes, oh, marking with the, with the rabbit plane. Um, yes, because what you have is if you have a rabbit plane that's cutting a rabbit or a dado plane that's cutting a dado, you actually have two little marking knives or one little marking knife of the rabbit sticking down on the side of the plane. And those really are marking knives and they work just like a marking knife. When you're marking a board, you're making that first cut and then the plane comes through and removes material down to the depth of that cut. And then you make another cut and the plane comes through and removes that. And so if you don't actually have a rabbit plane, what you can do is mark out the sides with your knife, take one or two passes, and then again come in and mark out the sides of the knife, and then take one or two passes, and this then becomes the spur on your plane. So yes, technically if you wanted to mark with the plane, you could just back the iron off and then slide your plane along your square and it would mark just fine. Never tried that, but no reason why I wouldn't. Oh, is that a super chat? Yes. So Greg says, had to miss the first, no, I can't talk, first half of the stream due to a piano technology seminar, so I'm sending you my fine. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Okay, hang on. Oh, we got the mom joke coming. She's yeah. been saving up for this week. So she's got some doozies here. Here, I've got one while she's waiting. No, I got it. Ready? Okay, wait. How do you keep bacon from curling in the pan? What? You take away their little brooms. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you this one. So if I take a, a uh, lead holder and I do this, do you know what that is? They can't see it, honey. You can't see it? Oh, here. There you go. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what this is here? That's a line dance. So Tom <laughs> threw up another super chat. So thank you, James. Running with the kitchen knife now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, uh, for a little over a year, I used an X-Acto knife instead of a marking knife. Um, I found that I didn't like the flexibility in the blade, but a lot of people out there really like using those. Um, and a lot of um, woodworkers actually like using the disposable thin blades. And they work great. Um, I just like something a little stiffer and more stout, so it's another personal preference. But yeah, any knife can be a marking knife. And there are so many different styles of them out there that are individual and different people like. It's kind of fun. What's next? Um. Oh, you're looking up a mom joke for him? Oh, I have mom joke. Well, I, I don't know. Are we counting the... Um, oh, the line dance? Line dance. <laughs> don't ask what this is supposed to be. That's pretty sad. 
<laughs> but another question. What's that? Derek Vitil... I can't tell you how to talk tonight. VTLO. Is that a murky knife? The one you guys made a video about a while back? Um, yes, this is... Well, this is one... Um, uh, this one is actually uh, from Tay Tools. And uh, it's one that I recommend. He actually based it off of um, my marking knife, design. <coughs> the marking knife that I use. Um, it's very, very similar to it. Mine has a little bit longer of a shank, um, but it's a one you can buy from Tay Tools. It's my the closest one I have found to my personal marking knife, and I, I really like it. A little space for the finger in there. Yeah, happiness. So Gerald Grosskoops Jr. wants to know, do you sell your own marking knives? I do not. Um, I've, I've thought about it, um, but Tay Tools um, contacted me about a year and a half ago and wanted my opinion on marking knives, and so that's one of the reasons why he made um, these ones, and they are really close to what I have. So I haven't had a desire to make my own because I don't know if I could do it for the price um, better than they can. So... Um, yeah, and the nice thing about that, he they sell them pre-made, or you can buy the kit and design your own handle, which is what I would like to do. Um, so if you want to see, I actually have a video where I bought uh, one of the kits and made a handle for it. Um, so you can see those. What else? We're good. What's that? We're good. We're good. Oh, oh, we got it. Okay, <laughs> trying to figure out where the joke was in that. We're good. Are you sure? We're good? <laughs> so. Um, Marking went through pencils and shoes. Ah, okay, cool. So the next thing we wanted to talk about is patterns. Um, you'll often find that whenever you're making a particular joinery, you'll end up making the exact same thing four or five times because most things there's four legs and all four legs are identical. Um, and so what you want to do is mark off of reality marking off there other than marking off a non-existent tape measure there's nothing there. okay imagine i have a tape measure so i take my tape measure and i go you are always fully. losing tape measures i have 17 Where is tape, tape measure labeled ken <laughs> it is it says ken on it um so i, I want to make a board two foot long and i need eight of them two foot long so i'm going to put it down here i'm going to tape it out take my knife and mark it and then mark all the way around the board, just like I did. No, I don't need it. Um, and I cut that board off. What most people end up doing is on the next one, they pull out the tape measure again, they mark it, they mark all the way around it, and they cut that one off. And the next one, they pull out the tape measure again. And the problem with that is now you are measuring to the tape measure. And all of those marks in the tape measure have a thickness to them. And the problem with that is that you end up making the boards ever so slightly different. And it may not sound like a problem, but anytime you have slight variations in things, that adds up and compounds over the whole piece that you're working on. What you wanna do is mark one of them, cut it to length, and then mark that one as a pattern. And I'll take it and I'll put a P on it. And that one is now your yardstick. And you use that to then mark all of your other boards. And the nice thing about it is you can actually take the board put it on there, and if your end is nice and square, like you cut it off right, now when you put it on there, you flush up one end, feel it with your fingers, flush it up along the edge, feel it with your fingers, and now you have a perfect edge that you can put the flat side of your knife on. The flat is, on, is up against it, the bevel is away from it, and you can get an exact line on here without even having to use the square because you know this end is flat, is square and true because you just cut it off square and true. And now you have a square and true line you can work on here. And I can pick that up and then continue this line all the way around like we showed before. And using this as my measurement on all of my other subsequent... Were you going to say subscribers? <laughs> subsequential boards? What's Subs the so, uh, subsequent. Subsequential boards. Subsequent no, not boards. subsequent. Subsequent boards. <laughs> <laughs> using this as my pattern means that all of my boards are going to be measured to the exact same distance. There is no thickness of a line difference on this. This is the exact measurement that I'm using to mark all my boards. 
And the more you can use a reality to make your marks, the more accurate it will be. Uh, if, if I wasn't making my furniture to have plans available on my website, I would never use a tape measure when making furniture. The reason being is I would rather cut something to reality and not care what the measurement is. Uh, most of the furniture that I've built, I've never used a tape measure to mark it out because I would rather have reality making it. When I made the dresser um, in our bedroom, I knew the top needed to fit between the doors. So I took a board up there and I set from one, one door to the other and I made a mark on that board. And that was the only measurement that I had. I, there was no reason to grab a tape measure because I had the reality of it. I made the length of the desk, the length of the dresser, and it needed to stick out from the wall about that far. That looked about right to me. So I made a mark and I cut the board. And then I wanted it to be about <laughs> that tall. I made a mark and I cut the board and the dresser was that tall. Now I had my legs at that length, so I need to have the, uh, the stretchers in between. So the stretchers needed to be the, uh, the thicknesses of the legs plus a little extra on the outside. And then the distance in between that was the length of my stretcher. So I put a board on there and I made a mark on reality. And every mark was then based off of something that was in existence, an actual board as opposed to a measurement. Because if I take a measurement of something and then I take it over and I use that exact same tape measure to make something out, I have a translation between them. And that translation then every time adds up to the thickness of the line. So if I make a measurement here at 36 inches, I have the thickness of the line here. Then I take my tape measure over here and I mark it out here and make my mark on there. I have to have the, the thickness of the line on there. So now just making that measurement from one space to another, I know that the thickness of the line on there, I have to double that. That's the variance in all my joinery from there on out. And so using a tape measure is the last thing I want to do there are times when that's what I have to use, but it's far better to use reality to make your measurements than it is to transfer from one place to the other. The reason that I have tape measures in my shop is when I want to translate what I'm making into a plan so that someone else can make it. I can't give you this board. Um, I can't give you the reality to make your measurements off of. So the only thing I can do is take a measurement and then hope that your measurements match up. Um, and so that's the only reason that I have a board is if I need to get information in or out of plans. Other than that, I really wouldn't use a tape measure in my shop. Um, so that's one of my, my personal pet peeves slash intrigues is that a lot of people really rely on their tape measures, but it's one of those things that you don't really need for most things if you just have reality in front of you. So, yeah. Um, and that will start a lot of arguments because there are people out there who live and die by their tape measures. And my tape measure is very accurate, so it's okay. <laughs> What's next? You have a question? No? Quiet chat? Cool. Oh, it's not a quiet chat. Oh, it's not? No. Oh, I need to go back and read it. Well, somehow we got into potty jokes and then um, Inception. Oh, wait, I started both of those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault. Yes. Um, let's see, there was one other point I wanted to get into marking. I can't remember what it was. He... Oh, um, marking gauges, or panel gauges and things like that. And this is one of the places where um, reality transferring is, is very important. Um, so anytime that I need to make a mark consistently, I try to make a pattern, but I can't always make a pattern. Um, or the surface might be too long, so putting a pattern on here and cutting all the way along that line may not be feasible. And that's where having a whole bunch of marking gauges really comes out. And I have a pile of marking gauges and I've got two more that are hiding somewhere around here. You can never have enough marking gauges. Um, and there are times when I wish I had more. And I have mortising gauges that have two or three pins. And I'll often have them set up with each of them at a different setting. Because I'll have, if I'm doing mortise and tenons out here, I will have 
Uh, one of them set up with the mortise and tenon thickness, so it has two pins on there. And then I'll have another one set up for the side shoulder measurement. And then I'll have another one set up for the length of tenon measurement. And so I can have all of these gauges set up on my, my bench that I know that if I need to make all of these measurements on a tenon, I'm going to make it the exact same size on every single one because this is my, my distance from here to the pin is the exact same on every one. And I know that they're all going to be the exact same. They're all going to follow off of reality because I'm using the same thing on there rather than setting out a, you know, a, a measurement and marking it at two and a half inches every time because that two and a half inches might sli slide easily. Again, the, the more accurate you can get to reality, the more accurate your joinery is going to be. The less gaps you're going to see, the less problems you're going to come into it. And so if you can get your, if you can get your marking, gauge down, marking game down, your joinery game will be that much better. Now that being said, joinery is the next skill you have to learn on. And you can have the best marking um, game in the world, but if your joinery game isn't great, well, then your joinery is still not going to be good. But if you have a great joinery game and your marking game is off, you're still not going to have good joinery. You need to have both of them. Um, so speaking of the, the joinery, the next problem that people have is you have this exact line on the board. If you're good, if you trust yourself, you cut straight on that line and you're done. That's what makes it great is it's fast, it's easy. You know where that line is exactly, you cut on it and you're done. You don't have to come back and adjust anything. But most of the time, you don't trust yourself. Most of the time, you're learning. And in that case, you have that exact line, but you're gonna to want to stay away from it and trim back to the line. And so staying away from it means that you have some to work with. You, you have that little bit of flexibility and that's great. But the problem is how do you work your way back to it? Because what happens is, let me grab these and these, and we've got our line on here. So I've got a half inch chisel here, which is a bit ragged. Oh no, it's just gunk on it. And I want to make a mark on this line here. So let's zoom in and see if we can see that line. Can you see that line, babe? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna put this right in that line and I'm going to drive down on it. Now, what I have here is something that's way out of focus. There we go. You can see that chisel mark in there is now actually on both sides of the line. It's mostly on this side of the line where the bevel was, but it's actually moved that way a little ways. You can see it's pushed back past the line. And that is where a lot of gaps come out in dovetails, is that people go right into the line, and with that hit, because it's a wedge, it forces it that way into the wood. And so what you want to do is you cut away from that line, and then you take off half the material back to the line. And then you take off half of that material back to the line. And then you take off half of that material. And then if you can, you take off half of that material. And then again, if you can, you take off half of that material and you stay away from it as long as you can. And every time you take off half the material and you take off half the material and you take off half the material until you just can't get any closer without putting the chisel right into the line. And then at that point, you hit the chisel lightly and you just lightly shave it off. Or at that point, it might be thin enough and your chisel sharp enough, you can just shave it off. And at that point, you're not going to push that line away. You're going to be just shaving off the excess you need. When people get overzealous and they try to take off too much material, that's when you push that line back. So if you are accurate with your marking and you give yourself good lines, those are only going to be as good as how well you protect them. So make good lines. Stay away from your lines. Protect your lines. Keep them as clean and crisp as possible for as long as possible. And then you'll have really nice, clean joinery. So is that your linear equation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's next? What's the question you got? 
Uh, let's see, Miguel Lopez. Any tips on using the Veritas marking gauge? I feel like it slips a ton, especially when going along the green. Um, yes. Um, the Well, here, this is, I, I did a, a video recently on marking gauges, uh, but this one is a wheel marking gauge. And you see these wheels on here. Um, you don't want these wheels to spin. You want them to be locked in there because this is actually a knife. And that knife will cut fibers just like the marking knife will. And the problem is, these are great for going across the grain. So I go on here, and I can slice the fibers with that knife. So just like a knife would, it slices the fibers. Um, but the problem is, if you run a knife along the grain, the knife tends to grab the grain and move in and out with it. And it can be very difficult to keep that on the grain without moving it. And so if you actually make the wheel roll then, then it does have a better tendency to be able to roll and jump over the grain and be able to follow along the grain. The problem with making it roll is that there's a little bit of flexibility in there and the, there's, there's a little bit of movement. So you're not getting quite as accurate a line. So usually when I'm going with the grain, I'm gonna use a pin type marking gauge and that's where I actually use pin type make marking gauges for all of my with the grain marks. I actually use the pin gauges far more than I use my wheels or knives. Um, these are phenomenal for going across the grain, but they're not great for going with the grain. Um, the pin gauges are great for going with the grain, but they're not really great for going across the grain. And so you gotta kind of play back and forth between the two. Um, so that's, that's the problem that most people have with uh, these wheel type marking gauges. What's next? Okay, I accidentally skipped Harold's question. So oh, we're sorry, going Harold. back to that one. Do you also mark curves with a knife and does it tend to follow the grain? Um, yes, any knife will tend to follow the grain. Um, and that's why you wanna keep with the, the light, medium, and hard. Your first pass of the knife should have a little bit more weight than the actual weight of the knife. You're not putting much in there. And that's gonna create a tiny little micro groove. So you're basically creating a new grain ring that the next time the knife will want to follow that previous mark and you're gonna go a little bit heavier. And then in your third one, then you can put the actual weight in and follow along. Uh, whenever you're going around a curved edge, you need to take a little bit more time and a little bit more careful. Um, often what I'll do is do a little mark and then 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 a little mark, a little mark um, as opposed to just trying to cleanly follow along the line. Uh, because it's, it's easy to then f try to follow the circle and then suddenly go straight. Um, whereas if you're just focusing on doing a little bit at a time, there's less chance that you're going to continue on and uh, uh, do that straight line. So, yeah, curves are difficult, but uh, doable. What's next? Uh, let's see. Kenny and Janet Horn asked, <clears throat> How do you deal with marking knife lines after? Leave them or sand them? Um, oh, oh, you're talking like on uh, um, dovetail edges and things like that if you mark past. Usually, um, on most joinery, I try not to mark past what I need. Um, a lot of times I don't actually mark the corners, so I'll stop just shy of the corner on either side, um, and that way I don't have any lines protruding past where I need them to be. Um, if, like on, on dovetails, on the end of the board, you have a mark that comes all the way across. Well, you're only cutting out the dovetail section, so you'll actually see the line extending uh, one way and then the other. I actually like to leave the line on there. I like, it just shows um, it's a hand cut joinery. Um, and I kind of like the look of it, just in, as long as it's there. If it's one of those where half of it's been sanded away and half of it's not, then I don't really like the look of that. But as long as it's a nice, clean line, um, I do like the look of that. Um, as to sanding it off, I usually actually scrape it off. I find that goes a little bit faster if I need to get rid of that. Um, scraping is a little bit uh, simpler to get down through things. And so I, I tend to find that easier and uh, a little bit more fun than sanding. <laughs> Nobody likes sanding. <laughs> What's next? Well, we have an off-topic question. I don't know if you're done with Sure. One. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much at the end of that, so we can get oh, questions. So Poorman asked, how is my bench coming? 
Uh, it's coming along. She oh, actually has uh, You Hashems, my oh, bench. Sorry. She can answer. I tell you. She often it's does. coming along. You can pan over here though. Yes, here. So there it is. All glued up. Oh, just a second, I haven't gone there. There, now you're on. All glued up. Hopefully. Should be good. It's been sitting there for a week and a half. Show me legs. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm waiting for the joke. They can't see my legs. Anyways. And They're then this short. <laughs> <laughs> Her bench will be 31 inches high. And then this is the long part, right? Yes. And this is where I got my... First blood. <laughs> Anyways, and I will tell you, you should not word work with flip flops. Yeah, <laughs> she tried wearing my clogs, but. Uh, oh no, I needed to wear the clogs afterwards. Well, one clog at a time, because when your leg is up here, you can't hold the clog. Yeah, usually when uh, when sawing, I tell people use a chair because you know usually a chair is at knee height, so it's e easy to kneel on it. Um, so if you don't have a, uh, a saw bench, then a chair works great. But uh, if you're short like Sarah, then a chair is even too high for that. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> cool. what the other Romans conquered all of here in flip-flops. <laughs> there you go. I used to wear sandals in the shop quite a bit and got chewed out for that. So then I made clogs. <laughs> Got other questions or should we wrap it up? I think this is where we draw the line. Sounds good. <laughs> oh, hang on. Wolf4404 says, if we're doing off-topic questions, anybody know a decent brand of auger bit files? Um, auger bit files is... I haven't come across a bad one. Let's put it that way. Um, as long as you're not getting one of like the, the cheap diamond files, um, those are yeah. Um, I haven't actually come across one. And the ones that I have are all cheap. Um, like the the cheap ones on Amazon, they they actually work really well. Um, yeah, because they're they're kind of hard to find. There's only a, a couple companies that actually make them. And so, is it worth getting like a high end Baco file? No, not in my book. Um, though if you're the type of person you like the absolute best, then yeah, go get it. Um, but most people aren't going to see the difference in the, the quality or the finish or the feel or anything of that nature for getting the cheap one and getting the, the really expensive one. So that's what I usually say for those. Go get something cheap and you'll find it'll work perfectly fine for you. And then someday down the road you'll be buying high-end tools for all sorts of other things and you'll be like, yeah, I'll get a high-end one. And you'll be like, works about the same. So... It's a file. <laughs> so that's about it. So I think we'll wrap it up. When are coming to Minnesota again? Well, <laughs> Sometime in 2022 when they let us out. Oh, they want to know how the table auction is coming. Ah, yes. The, uh, the, the coffee table is still up for sale. I think the current bid is $300, which is dirt cheap. Um, that just about covers materials. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you want to uh, bid on the coffee table, it is in the description down below. So uh, yeah, uh, it closes on uh, it closes on Saturday. So Saturday at noon. Perez wants to know: Is there a brand that makes good auger bits? Um, as to auger bits, actually, uh, stay tuned for Thursday's video. I'm gonna have an entire video dedicated to auger bits coming out because there are some um, things that I've been waiting on for a while. Um, but hint, hint, um, I just got a set of wood owl auger bits. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, now I got another question. What's that? Last question. I mean, we're still five minutes early. Dennis Miko asks, do you have a bevel angle gauge for finding angles on chisels? No. I don't care what the angle is on it. The angle on my chisel is that. 
Um, people really get bent out of shape over the types of angles and what their angle and being at 25 degrees as opposed to 26 degrees. And the difference between 25 and, six, 25 and 26 is nothing. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't worry about the angle. As, you know, if you're within five or six, you're golden. Um, it really doesn't make that big a difference. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. If, if I did, then I would grab, you know, this thing, and I could set that on there and I could go, uh, these are currently at 30 degrees ish. Actually, if I want to get accurate, it's at uh, actually 28 and a half degrees. So there's the angle I have it at. Um, but yeah, I just find a little angle finder like that if I need that. So. Cool. Um, anything I'm forgetting? wrap it up. So I think that'll about do it for this week. Uh, next week we're going to have the, uh, the monthly Q&A, so stay tuned for that. If you have anything particular you want us to talk about, let us know. Um, the auction is still ongoing until Saturday, so links to that down below. And I think that will about do it for now. So when's Sarah's video going to go out? Um, if we get enough done on it next Saturday. A week from this Saturday? Yes, or this if you get enough done on it. You told me I'm not helping you. You have to be around. I'm always around. <laughs> I love you. We won't go there. Anyways. So on that note, thank you all for watching. And until next time, have a wonderful Bye. night.